right. Live. All right. Take us away, Nate. All right. My name is Nate Robinson, and we will be going over structured inequality, sport, and social class. Uh, to start, we'll start in chapter 21, and uh, the title of the chapter is The Big Time College Sports Plantation and Slip. So in uh, chapter one, they talk about the plantation system, which is basically comparing the NCAA athletics to slave plantations. Um, so athletes or slaves in this example are exploited economically they make millions for their masters but only are provided with a substance of room board tuition and books um, they're con controlled with restricted freedoms they are subject to physical and mental ab abuse from their overseers or coaches and uh, the master slave relationship is accepted by the athletes as legitimate So next, uh, the plantation profits from the work of slaves. So sporting events generate millions of dollars for schools, yet the workers or athletes are not paid. So college sports are an $8 billion industry, and that doesn't include the revenues from corporations like ESPN and CVS, uh, who make millions off their telecasts. Um, universities sell various sponsorships to enterprises for advertising so things like naming rights for stadiums um, those are usually multi multi-million dollar deals um, several several college football and basketball coaches make over five million dollars per year and then uh, a lot of schools have lucrative deals with apparel companies that are all worth millions of dollars for the school um, so next, getting into the injustice of amateurism, uh, the NCAA has devised rules to eliminate economic benefits for athletes. Um, so athletes are really only allowed to receive educational benefits, except uh, in the past few years, these rules have been updated a little bit due to NIL, and now players can make money off of their name, image, and likeness. Next, we have the restrictions on the rights and freedoms of the slaves or athletes. So the NCA schools and coaches restrict the freedoms of athletes in many ways. So stuff like the right to privacy is regularly invaded for college athletes. Um, stuff like mandatory drug testing, uh, spies at local bars to watch out for bad behavior, bed checks, um, social media activity, um, political protests, stuff like that. Those are among ways that um, Coaches can restrict the freedoms of their athletes. Um, next, the oppression, brutality, and terror. So keeping the slaves or athletes in their place. Um, many athletes face physical and mental abuse from their coaches every day at practice and stuff. And um, the book lists multiple examples of people like Bobby Knight and Lou Holtz. And uh, myself and I'm sure many other athletes across the country have all dealt with this at some point. Um, next, we have the slave mentality. So uh, athletes rarely resist the authoritative, authoritarian and unjust regime, which would be the NCA. Um, so, I mean, athletes have been thoroughly conditioned through their many years of organized sport involvement to obey athletic authorities. So most college athletes are faithful servants to the system of college sport and rarely question what's going on. Um, the small graduation rates, many reasons for low graduation rates among big time college athletes. Uh, most athletes really never make it to the professional level, so earning that college degree is vital to their future success. 
but a lot of times athletes are accepted into a school because of their athletic ability and that doesn't really mean that their academic ability fits the school and so they're just going to struggle from the start um a lot of times coaches tend to get caught up in trying to win and forget to emphasize the student part of the student athlete um so those are just a couple reasons that um big time college athletes tend to have lower graduation rates and uh lastly just changing the plantation system um so the nca and the system desperately need to change um, in the last few years it has been changed with the introduction of the nil rules and things like that so now um there's just been updated transfer rules and athletes are able to get a little economic benefits off of their athletic achievements and things like that. So next we'll get into chapter 22. Um, so in this we'll look at is sport a mobility escalator? So um, will sport participation facilitate upward mo upward social mobility? Um, so people from low socioeconomic backgrounds who become wealthy and famous because of their sports achievements, um, that would be a demonstration of upward social mobility. Um, the picture on the right here is LeBron James, and that's probably one of the most famous examples of this. Um, just, a just a kid from a poor background and, um, from his athletic success, he's became a, a billionaire. Um, so this happens in almost every sport besides those restricted to uh, upper class. So like sports like polo, skiing, golfing, yachting, stuff like that. There's really no upward social mobility because you already start in the top of the social classes. Um Successful professional athletes in most sports must attend both high school and college. And in turn, this increases their chance for success outside of the sports world. So just that college education will give them what they need to have a successful career in the workforce. Um, college athletes who come from a family of low social class, uh, low, low social status will almost always surpass their parents' socioeconomic status just because of the uh, college education that they obtained when playing college athletics. Um, next, we'll look at uh, a couple of studies that have compared the potential of upward social mobility between athletes and non-athletes. So the first one was a uh, study between Notre Dame uh, football players and Notre Dame students. And uh, so although the Notre Dame players came from poorer backgrounds, they had achieved equivalent incomes with non-athletes at Notre Dame. Um, the next study looked at uh, former athletes working in business, military, or manual labor occupations and it showed that they were better off financially than former non-athletes. And lastly, um, high school athletes compared to non-athletes were more likely to earn a bachelor's degree, have a full-time job, and have a higher income. So um, more on that, uh, athletes possess achievement indicators for more upward social mobility. And specifically, male athletes are more upwardly mobile, and there are at least three reasons for this listed in the book. Um, the first one would be athletic participation may lead to various forms of occupational sponsorship. So occupational sponsorship would be stuff that's like uh, if you're an alum, uh, alum of a school, and another alum of a school can give you a job, uh, stuff like that, just things to use your college athletics to get you places in life. Um, so athletes may fare better in job interviews that require applicants to be well-rounded. Um, 
and there's a possibility that participation in highly competitive sports situations will lead to the development of valuable attitudes and behavior patterns. So just being in those tough, difficult situations that college athletics puts you in will make you pretty desirable for a lot of people when they're hiring you and want to get you a job. So now looking at uh, demythologizing the uh, social mobility through sport hypothesis. So the first myth is that sport provides a free college education. Um, and very few basically do athletic scholarships. It's only about 2% of high school athletes receive an athletic scholarship. Um, next, the myth is participation in sport leads to a college degree. And that's uh, fewer than half of the college athletes graduate with college degrees. Um, and then just looking in the pro athletics, um, the people who do make it to the pros, uh, we're never really focused on their school too much while we're, they were there because only 53% of NFL players have their degree and only 20% of NBA players have their college degree. Uh, the next myth is a professional sports career is possible for successful high school and college athletes. And um, less than 0.01% of athletes will play professionally. And most likely if they do, it will be a short career. Um, so three in, in 10,000 high school basketball players will get drafted in the NBA, which just shows you how little, how little amount of people will actually make it. And I mean, if you do make it, the average career in the NFL is about three to five years. Um, so if you do make it, it's never, it's never really that long of a time that you're in the NFL or NBA making that amount of money. Um, the next myth that we'll look at is uh, sport is a way out of poverty, especially for racial minorities. Um, so if the effort towards sporting success was directed towards other areas, upward mobility would occur for many more people in these demographics. Uh, two thirds of African American children uh, believe that they can make it to the make it to the professional level in sports, um, and about point zero 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 two percent of African Americans. Uh, go on to become pro athletes. Next, uh, women now have a sport as a vehicle for upward mobility because of new opportunities. Uh, women have much less professional sporting opportunities than men. Um, just if you look at the professional women's sporting leagues across the country, um, like the WNBA, I think that has about half the amount of teams that the NBA does. Um, just things like that, and the the sporting opportunity or the yeah the sporting opportunities that exist for women at the pro level mostly are the sports that are associated with the upper class, so things like tennis or golf, stuff like that, which don't ever really have that much opportunity for upward social mobility to begin with. Um, lastly. A uh, professional sports career provides lifelong stability. Um, so even when a sports professional sports career is attained, the chance of fame and fortune is very limited. I mean, as I said earlier, the uh, average career for NFL players is about three to five years. Um, so really, it's a small amount of the NFL players who are really playing in the NFL for 15 years, making hundreds of millions of dollars. It's just not usually how it goes. All right. Appreciate it, Nate. So I'm Jack Rodokoven, and uh, my chapter uh, was called um, – oh, frick. I had uh, – it was uh, When Domes Attack is the name of the um, chapter. And uh, basically, this chapter is about stadiums, um, you know, domes, um kind of become popular in the past uh 20 or so years 
uh, and how they've essentially become uh, white elephant um, issues for cities and civilians to solve. And yet no one's really doing what needs to be done to solve the problems that these stadiums uh, create. And a lot of people fall into the track and thinking that stadiums are um, solutions to problems that have been festering within cities, you know, very complex problems, um, tackling problems like uh, homelessness, homelessness rates uh, being one of them, uh, another one being uh, job opportunities uh, for people that might not be able to get one. Um, just because of, you know, lack of jobs or lack of good jobs. Um, but essentially, these stadiums actually end up keeping um, these very same institutions in place uh, and actually help foster those institutions, those bad institutions, even further, um, rather than helping uh, advance them and uh, make them go away. And, you know, well over... $30 billion in the past, you know, 20, 25 years alone have been spent um, from taxpayer money um, for stadium construction and upkeep. Um, a lot of these owners and uh, franchises are able to pretty much coax uh, the city uh, or the taxpayers into paying that stadium for them and it i this is very not very good for the taxpayer because obviously they're the ones footing the bill and it's their land upon which that stadium is built um and this is a very complex problem because well the owners themselves actually and have billions of dollars they if you own a nfl franchise and there's 31 owners um, it's more than likely that you actually have a net worth of upwards in the uh, billion digits. And um, just for instance, the uh, Broncos, uh, Denver Broncos and Washington Commanders, they just got sold for billions of dollars. Um, you know, and the Broncos for one were actually owned by um, the Walton family, which actually owns Walmart, uh, you know, that whole uh, chain. And so obviously their net worth is through the roof. Yet if they were to go ask the city of Denver or the state of Colorado for funding for their stadium, they would probably get it mainly because the stadium doesn't want, uh, sorry, the city or the state doesn't want that team to leave uh, for a different city or state. that's actually going to be willing to pay that stadium for them. And these stadiums, you know, they're, they're presented as instant problem solvers, you know, microwave dinner esque, um, you know, helping solve problems like bad schools, you know, poor infrastructure, and just people leaving uh, for the suburbs or to the uh, country. And again, like I said, these elected officials, they don't want to be known as the person who loses the team. Uh, in the city of Pittsburgh, uh, where I'm from, actually, um, there's a time. Uh, in which the Pittsburgh Penguins, uh, the beloved hockey team, was actually talking about leaving. Um, and it wasn't until the city actually showed out millions of dollars in taxpayer money to build a brand new arena downtown. Um, and it's a very nice arena, but it creates a lot of problems because um, it's just the public in general doesn't want to be foot in the bill. In fact, the uh, funding for that bill actually comes from um, airport tickets uh, that you get for parking. Uh, they add an extra little bit of tax on it, and that's how they pay for it. Like, I don't want to be spending more money at the airport for uh, a ticket to park. That's just that's just me, but a lot of people don't. A lot of counters to the argument of these stadiums is that they actually create jobs. And while that's true... Those jobs are usually very uh, poorly paid and they're usually very seasonal. Um, like baseball, for instance, the season normally lasts from about April to uh, October, if you're lucky, if you make the playoffs. Um, but from 
that late October all the way to March, people are out of a job. They they can't work for that organization. Uh, they can't work in concessions or security or whatever situation they might be in unless they're in that administrative uh, upper office role. And people are starting to wake up and notice this problem. So citizens are starting to push back and starting to, you know, have a little bit of outrage towards public officials about using their hard earned money towards construction of a stadium that doesn't necessarily need to be built. In this chapter, they took a look at three state, uh, three cities in particular, New Orleans, uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, or and St. Paul, um, you know, the twin cities. And then the third city was actually Washington, D.C., our nation's capital. So let's start with New Orleans here. So Hurricane Katrina, awful, awful disaster, um, happened in about August of 2005. And, um, you know, in the... In the 1990s, uh, in the ninth, like early on, like, you know, in the late, um, in the past century, there's a lot of talk about a publicly funded um, New Orleans stadium and convention center, which became known as the Superdome. I think it's known as the Caesar Superdome. It was known as the Mercedes-Benz Super Bowl for a long time. And uh, they spent a bunch of money on it. Uh, they it was part of a uh, it was basically part of a business district um, that New Orleans actually dubbed New New Orleans, um, but it actually ended up pretty much flopping. Um, but obviously, the Saints uh, moved into the stadium, and it's been their home for a very long time. It's actually been one of the longer tenured uh, NFL stadiums that I know of, but it turned into a homeless shelter during this horrible disaster from Hurricane Katrina. Uh, and this has been saw, uh, this there's been problems, obviously New Orleans is uh, right about sea level, so very susceptible to flooding. Um, but it also suffers from a lot of poor infrastructure and a lot of poor uh, social welfare programs that could be going towards helping out uh, the people. Um, and obviously New Orleans they invested a lot of money in this and they wanted to make it the best fit possible. Um, and they tore up a lot of ground uh, for it. But it's not the first time New Orleans has done something like it. Uh, Jazz legend Louis Armstrong, his neighborhood was actually ripped up and turned into a parking lot just so that, you know, people can get, can just park their car and go somewhere. And the city actually collects revenue from those parking fees or whoever owns that parking lot. But the funny part about how that uh, stadium got turned into a homeless shelter is it's actually the first time that people may have even ever seen the inside of the Superdome. Um, $90 was the average ticket price um, that year for a single game. And $90 in 2005 was a lot of money. Um, maybe not so much nowadays. Inflation's a... Um, Kicks butt, but you know, ninety dollars was very expensive for an NFL game. Season tickets were upward, upwards worth of one thousand three hundred dollars, and uh, sweet boxes were going as much as six figures. Uh, so this is the very first time that these people have ever even seen the inside of the Superdome, uh, and here it is being used as a homeless shelter. And. New Orleans is still suffering from low wage jobs that continue to separate upper and lower classes. And this stadium is the crux of it. You know, it's, it's only used for special events for football games. I mean, football games only happen once a week. So what, what happens during those other six days of the week when people aren't able to work that job and they're being paid just about minimum wage. So this continues to separate upper and lower classes and cause a lot of problems in the economy in New Orleans. Funny thing is, is that when the hurricane continued to get worse, the homeless people were actually shipped off to Houston. And Houston just spent billions of dollars on a brand new baseball stadium and brand new football stadium. Billions of dollars of taxpayer money. And this taxpayer money that Houston could have used could have gone towards children that were living under the poverty line. About a third children living in Houston at the time who live in beneath the poverty line. 
I'm sure that the stat has changed because Houston has, you know, kind of changed itself recently in the past 15 or so years. But man, it's very ironic that by sending people off to this other city, they, they were kind of within that same situation that, uh, New Orleans found itself in. The next, uh, the next city I want to address is actually Minnesota. So Twin Cities, um, it's the main metropolitan area in Minnesota. It's one of the largest cities in the United States uh, that doesn't really get talked about a whole lot. And basically, what happened was the Metrodome, um, the Humphrey H. Humphrey Metrodome. Uh, was falling apart and it was falling apart for a long long time um it back in the 1960s it was even called by um the twins manager at the time um the baseball team it was called by the twins manager basically pretty much a dump um a bad place to play so it's fascinating that they're able to continue playing in it for you know an additional uh 40 years on top of that and the twins owner is actually um one of the richest uh, owners and professional sports. Um, he is well worth billions of dollars. Um, his name is, I think, Carl. Sorry, I had it right here. Uh, Carl po Poland. And he's worth billions of dollars. And he actually uh, earned his money um, through basically foreclosing people during the Great Depression. Um, so a pretty unethical way to get a lot of make a lot of money uh, during a tough time period. So obviously he was able to finance the twin stadium all by himself. Uh, you would think that he would have no problem doing so. Um, he can easily foot the $500 million bill that was needed to build um, what we now know today as target field, which is a great field um, way better than the Metrodome ever was. So they're looking to secure over $500 million in funding. And basically he had people working for him basically say that Minnesota would turn into Bismarck, North Dakota, if they didn't get the stadium. And then the twins ended up would end up moving to a different city, which obviously didn't happen because he did eventually get the, he did actually eventually get the funding. Um, and there was a, he basically um, fought his way into getting a public referendum. And a lot of people actually voted up uh, against uh, the funding and they just didn't want to build a new stadium uh, so he resorted to emotional manipulation tactics tactics he actually used a child that was already dead in an ad to help get funding um, from public officials for the, the stadium and eventually it came down to him bribing uh, pretty much straight up uh, public officials and pretty soon after that, the public officials actually ended up signing a bill that got him the funded to build a stadium. The very same week that the groundbreaking for Target Field was actually supposed to begin, a state, uh, the bridge, uh, the Mississippi Bridge on I-35 West actually collapsed. Again, result of, poor, result of poor infrastructure and problems that the city has had issues with for many, many years. So the celebration plans were actually put aside. Obviously, it was an awful disaster that happened. Um, many people died. A lot more were injured. Um, it was just a horrifying incident. Um, basically, there was a saying uh, by one of the former New York mayors that if uh, people just don't care about ballparks, so you got to go past them. And... So they went straight. So the guy went straight for the leg legislature and ended up working out for him. And this just really highlights why money should be used um, for public works instead of stadiums, uh, because stadiums actually don't fix any of the problems internally that these cities and uh, these states actually have. Last but not least, I want to talk about Washington, D.C., and you would think that the nation's capital would be a great place to live, but it's not exactly uh, very good. Um, there's high prison rates. About 50% of African Americans are actually incarcerated. Uh, you got HIV rates that are through the roof. You got poverty rates that are super high. And you just got overall horrible infrastructure. 
the uh, nation's capital deserves way better. It has been probably dubbed as one of America's worst cities to live in. And what happened in the midst of all of this, you know, you got these bad things, their stats are skyrocketing. Uh, basically, the D.C. mayor uh, basically unilaterally approved the bill of $1 billion to build a brand new stadium. It was actually originally on the docket for $611 uh, million, but it went about $400 million over budget. And this was a good offer for a team, the Montreal Expos. Uh, we're looking to leave Canada and move to the United States, and Washington was a good destination for them. Um, and it was a great deal for the MLB uh, because they didn't have to pay a single cent. Um, they they could still look for new ownership for the team, um, and they wouldn't have to foot the bill. Um, and instead, the people did, uh, but not directly. It was actually indirectly, and actually ended up affecting them even worse. Um, instead of pulling straight from the people. Um, it was actually showed up in business taxes. And basically this led to a mass exodus of businesses in the DC area. Uh, because obviously by taxing these businesses, um, they're going to have to raise their prices and they're not going to make as much of a profit. So these businesses started leaving and people stopped buying goods. And the entire situation just crumbled on its face and poverty skyrocketed yet again. And infrastructure just continued to get worse. Because a billion dollars was used to build a baseball stadium instead of fixing a lot of problems that DC has. And this stands in contrast to cities like St. Louis and Detroit, who also might not be in the best situation at the time, but the the owners actually footed majority of the bill when it came to building the stadium, which is a lot more than a lot of other teams could say. And instead of the city themselves making the situation worse for their people. And the st stadium itself continues to cause economic stagnation in D.C. People can't get out of poverty. People can't fix um, their own internal problems inside those neighborhoods. And basically, it has culminated when uh, two trains collided uh, and it ended up killing nine people and injured many, many more. Uh, because this billion dollars that could have been used to build better infrastructure uh, for the people actually ended up buying them in the, buying them to behind. And uh, the people of DC really do deserve better um, when it comes to the funding uh, for social projects that could actually be used to benefit people instead of just a select few that just have the money to go to nationals games. And this quote, for me, uh, in this last part of the chapter, really stuck out to me. Uh, it's from Roger Knoll, who's the co-author of Sports, Jobs, and Taxes, uh, The Economic Impact of Sports Teams and Stadiums. And it basically reads that any independent study shows that it's an investment. It's silly. They're trying to sell it on the grounds of actually contributing to economic growth and employment in D.C. There's never been a publicly subsidized stadium anywhere in the United States had the effect of increasing employment and economic growth in the city it was built. And this is obviously a big problem that two cities, in my opinion, which are cool places to be, uh, me having living close to one, Buffalo, the other one being Tampa Bay, they're planning on building big, brand new stadiums for their teams. And a lot of this is going to be publicly funded. And if history repeats itself, just like uh, what Roger Noel is saying here, I don't think it's actually going to turn out very well for these cities um, because the si people are going to be ended up footing the bill and it's actually going to end up hurting the cities even more. And that's it. That's all we got for you.